Uh, but we're going to just, what I'm going to do is read this chapter and then make some observations. We're going to look at a few verses here and there. Because I don't want to miss part of the story. I don't want to just read half the story and then preach that, and then next week read the other half and preach that. I want to give you the big picture. And then tonight in our Bible study, we're going to focus in a little more and cover the details that we're not able to get to this morning. Okay? Now, as I told you, as we started off this study, that Daniel is a very um, complex book of the Bible. There's a lot of stuff in the book of Daniel that, you know, we can dig into. And I could probably preach on just chapter 2 for a month by itself, if not longer. But for the sake of time, I'd like to finish Daniel before Jesus comes back or I'm dead. So we're going to just kind of work through this and get the main points. We're going to begin reading this morning in Daniel chapter 2. The sermon is titled, Who is this King of Glory? And I'm just going to tell you before we start, the whole point of this sermon is just to brag on God. Uh, you're not going to see me try to say, you know, what does this mean for you today? There are sermons where we do that, but sometimes we just need to take a step back and just brag on God. How great is God? And I have a feeling that as we do this, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be very blessed as we look at who God is. Daniel chapter 2, I'll begin reading in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But, verse 6, But if you show the dream, and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. So we have right now, I'm just going to take a few little rest stops along the way, get out and stretch our legs for a minute. Uh, right now, what's happening is King Nebuchadnezzar, who is a bad king, who has taken God's people as captives and slaves, uh, he is having a dream that's troubling him, and he calls upon the wise men of his day in his country to come and tell him the dream. They said, well, why don't you tell us what the dream is, and then we'll interpret it for you. He says, I got a better idea. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the dream. You guess the dream, and you tell me what it means, all right? And if you do it right, you're going to have all this great stuff. If you don't do it, and if you don't get it right, we're going to tear you to live from live. <laughs> He's not a good guy, okay? All right, so we begin, or we continue reading here uh, in verse 7. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream. We will show his interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. He says, listen, you're trying to stall. Uh, you need to go ahead and get on this. Tell me what it means. In verse 10, it says, The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asked is difficult. And, <clears throat> excuse me, no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. I want to stop here for a moment as we examine our first point, our first thought, that he is greater than any on earth. Who is this king of glory? That's the question that the psalmist asked there in the book of Psalms, and I'm stealing what the psalm says and using it for my sermon title today, because as I put the sermon together, this question came to mind, who is like our God? The answer is nobody. There is no God like our God. Uh, you look at the world religions, they are not like our God. 
Uh, Christianity is the only religion where our God has sent his own son to die in our place. The only God who offers forgiveness not by our works or achievement, but by his love and mercy, by a way that he has provided by his own blood. He is greater than any on earth. This is who our God is. First and foremost, he's greater than all. Nebuchadnezzar wanted what nobody on earth could offer. He wanted somebody to tell him what he had dreamed. Now, if you were to come to me and say, Pastor, tell me what I dreamed last night. I'd say, I don't know. I mean, for me, I probably dreamed about going somewhere fun and eating some good food. That's probably what I would dream about. Maybe I dreamed the Saints win another Super Bowl. Maybe you can guess my dreams, but I couldn't guess yours. He said, listen, I want you to give me something that I don't think anybody can give. That's what they said in verse 10. The Chaldeans, that's these enchanters, these magicians. They said, there's not a man on earth who can do this. There's nobody on earth who can read your mind and tell you what you dream and then tell you what that dream means. I've had dreams that are crazy. I don't know what they mean. I, I've always had this dream that I'm jumping on a trampoline and I go way up in the sky and I'm falling. I'm terrified of heights. That's a nightmare for me. Uh, we all have crazy dreams. Psychologists will try to say, well, your dreams mean this or your dreams mean that. If you dream about fish a lot, it means this. If you dream about tigers a lot, it means that. Whatever. The truth is, no man on earth knows these things. But yet this man, who is supposedly the greatest king, he is the God who's in charge of this great nation. He is this man who in chapter 1, the Bible says he actually overthrew God's people, only because God allowed it. And he actually took the things used to worship God and put them in the house of his false God as a slap in God's face. But God allowed it. He's doing all of this stuff, and yet he's having to realize he is troubled by his dreams, and nobody on earth can tell him what his dreams mean. There's not a man on earth. Down in verse 11, it says, the thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods. Well, they were almost right, weren't they? Because it's not the gods who can reveal things, but it's the God. The God. We see here these people, although they are magicians and enchanters, they are caught up in the dark arts, they are caught up in witchcraft and sorcery and things like that. They believe this stuff. They're sold out to this stuff. Even they have enough sense to realize we are not that powerful. I don't think there's anybody on earth who can do it. Nebuchadnezzar, you better just talk to the gods about this one. Even in their messed up understanding of divinity and gods, they realize, you know what? We can't do this. I think we would do well to remember the same thing. Nobody on earth can do what God can do. No wisdom of this age, no human power, no authority can do what God can do. I think that these mag magicians and enchanters are better theologians than a lot of preachers today. So many preachers say, listen, if you want something, just go do it. If you want something, just give a little more money. You want to be happy and healthy and wealthy? Just, you know, just send me your five hundred dollars today in the mail, and God will bless you. But listen, they even have enough sense to realize that nobody on earth can do this. There's no magician, no enchanter, no Chaldean. Nobody in our country can do this. Nobody that we would recommend can do this, but the gods. The, the James tells us even the demons believe there is one God, and they shudder. They were almost right, but they had enough sense to know it can't be found on earth. Our solutions are not found on earth. Our needs are not met on earth. The greatest and most powerful being is not found on earth, but in heaven. He is God Almighty. That is who our King of glory is. He is greater than any on earth. We continue reading the story in verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry. And very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So, verse 13, the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Remember, this is God's people. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God's people who were brought in, God had given them favor. They were God's faithful people living in a pagan and godless society for a purpose. Now, I believe that's what we are today. We are God's people 
living in a godless and pagan society for a purpose. We see here they come out to try to kill Daniel, verse 14. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion. Oh, that we would have some of that. Some prudence and some discretion in our speech. Some thoughtfulness, some grace, some smarts. He says to Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise of Babylon. Verse 15, he declared to Ariok, the king's captain, Why is this decree of the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So he says, okay, why are we in such a hurry here? They're going to come. I mean, I can just imagine swords are out, guns are blazing. All right, we, we have an order to kill all the wise men. Daniel, that includes you and your guys. You went to the king's school, remember? They were given the king's diet, the king's education. They were trained in how to be Babylonians. They were trained in how to do things for him, uh, to be one of the king's people. And he says, listen, kill them all. Daniel says, hold up a minute. Why don't you just let me uh, take some time? Schedule me an appointment to meet the king. And in that time, we're going to be doing what we can to figure this thing out. No need to hurry. I don't know about you, but I'd probably do the same thing. Somebody comes with a sword to kill me. Hold up now. Give me a minute. <laughs> Give me a few days to figure this out. Don't kill me. Let me at least pray about it. Why don't you see what I can do? Maybe they couldn't do it, but my God can. And that's, that's what he's doing. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But their names have been changed. Remember, so these are God's people right here. He's going and talking to his brothers. And he says, listen, verse 18. And told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven. Do you see the contrast there? Back uh, in verse number 11, it says, listen, the gods. The gods can do this. The, the people who are not following God said, well, we can't figure this out, but the gods can. Well, Daniel's people said, listen, we're going to cry out to the God, duh, of heaven, singular, one God, the true God. And what does he do? He says, we're going to cry out to him concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. But, but you know what they did? They prayed about it. Can I say that again? They prayed about it. We are commanded all throughout Scripture to pray about things. And we sometimes get to a point where we say, I'm just not even going to pray about this. I just don't, I don't, I don't know what good it's going to do. Or maybe we say, that's just too easy. Or maybe you start thinking too much and you say, well, God's going to do what God's going to do anyway. Why would I even pray about it? My, my prayers aren't going to accomplish anything. What I want to know is how much are you leaving on the table if you need your prayer life? You hear basketball players, it's March Madness right now. You see this school come from behind and win, and they get to go on to the Final Four. And they're, the, you know, they're the Cinderella story. They're, they're, they're the dark horse. Right? What was it? A Texas Tech beat. Was it Gonzaga? Yeah. yeah. That's a big deal. Hey, Texas Tech, right? Record Tech. Good stuff, right? We don't see it coming. And we think, you know what? It's going to happen anyway. You know, what if we just said, I'm going to leave it all out on the court? That's what these people say. I left it all out on the basketball court today. Every bit of blood, sweat, and tears. And you know what? Good things happen when you leave it all out on the court. What if we left it all out on the court in our prayer life? And we say, God, I'm giving it all I got. God, I'm seeking you. God, I'm praying. God, I, I, I'm reading your word. God, I'm doing all I can to follow you. You know what? God just might decide to do something. Not that we change God's mind or change God's will, but there are things I believe God has in store for us sitting on the shelf of heaven somewhere. It doesn't say it's in the Bible. This is just what it seems to be like in Scripture. It seems like God has a shelf full of goodies to give us. It says, if only they would pray. It's my plan to give it to them, but the condition is, will they pray for it? Um, will you pray for it? Will you pray for wisdom? We know certain things are God's will. It's God's will that we be wise. God's will that we would not sin. God's will that we would find the right spouse. God's will that we would live in his will in our careers, our lives. God's will that we would obey his word. If we pray for these things, you know what? God will honor those prayers. Let's be sure and pray for these things. It was God's will that Daniel and his buddies would know the interpretation of this dream, but they prayed for it too, didn't they? 
Can I just tell you, quit thinking so much and just start praying a little more? Quit trying to figure it out and just start praying. You're not called a man to figure it out. You're called a man to ask, seek, and knock. Let God be God. Let God do what he can do. And you just obey what he says. They sought mercy from the God of heaven. Verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven and said this. Which brings us to our second. Who is this king of glory? He is all powerful. Do you believe that God is all powerful? Let me try that again because this ought to get you a little bit excited. Don't make me, don't make me work harder this morning. Don't make me preach harder this morning. Do you believe that God is all powerful? Yes. yes. Amen. Who is more powerful than God? I'll go you one better. Who is the equal of God? I'll go even one better. Who can even say they're in second place to God? Who can say they're in fifth place? Well, you know, I'm not that powerful, but I'm, I'm fifth place behind God. I don't know anybody who's willing to say that. <laughs> if they are, there's something wrong with them. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was as good as God, and now Nebuchadnezzar's having dreams he can't figure out. God puts you in your place. He's all powerful. When God reveals the meaning of this dream, and by the way, he does that in response to faith. He does that in response to prayer. He does that in accordance with his own will. Daniel has this outburst of blessing. It's almost as if Daniel says, I've got it. Praise the Lord. And he goes on talking about God. This is what he says. It's almost as if Daniel sings a song right here. Now, I'm not going to sing to you. Okay? You, can, you don't worry. I'm not going to sing to you. I'm not one of those singing preachers. I don't have that gift. But let's take a look at what he says. If you notice in your Bible, it's written like it's a song. We might call this the song of Daniel. It says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. Verse 21, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Verse 22, He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. To you, O oh God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might. And have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. It's almost as if he's just ready to go off and start singing. I guess I lied to you. I sang a little bit. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> he is all powerful. Look at what he's saying here. He says, He owns wisdom and might. That's what it says in verse 10. Excuse me, verse 20. I wrote over the two. Verse 20, it says, To him to whom belong wisdom and might. God owns wisdom and might. You own your shoes. God owns wisdom and might. How's that for perspective? You own the shoes you walked in here this morning on. God owns wisdom and mind. He also changes the times and seasons. It's going to be 100 degrees in a few months or a few weeks or a few days. We don't ever know anymore. A few minutes. Because God wants it to be. And there's some parts of the world it's going to be freezing cold because God wants it to be. Some parts of the earth the leaves are turning green. Some parts of the earth the leaves are falling off because God wants it to be. Some parts of the world, there's typhoons and hurricanes and earthquakes and floods and famines and everything because God wants it to be. Either you believe that God is who he is or, or he's not. God's in control of all of it or he's in control of none of it. He changed the times and the seasons. It also says that he removes kings and sets up kings. Every king, every prime minister, every president is there because God wants them to be. And when they get elected out of office or taken out of office or killed or assassinated or whatever, they just get up and quit because God takes them out. In our society where we vote and we have politicians and we have representatives and the Senate and the House, it can be kind of confusing for us. But let me just put it this way. To us, it looks like we are in control, but God's always ultimately in control. You can't figure out how or why, but he is. doesn't matter who's in power, who's in control, pray for them. Do your best to honor them, but understand that God put them there. 
And God has a purpose, even if it may not be convenient for us. He also gives wisdom and knowledge. I'm glad for that because I don't have any wisdom or knowledge of my own. <laughs> I can be kind of a watermelon head sometimes. Just, you know, lights are on but no one's home. Sean, you're shaking your head too much on that. Sean's picking on you today. But he gives us wisdom and knowledge. Nobody is smart unless God lets them be. Nobody has understanding unless God gives them. Finally, he reveals hidden things and knows the unknowable. This ought to really resonate with you because we need to say God knows the things about you no one else does. God knows the things about you you may hide from other people. You might say, well, no one saw me. God watched you. God witnessed you. You might say, well, no one really knows how I feel about this. God knows how you feel. God knows things you don't know, even about yourself. And yet he's still willing to save you. That's great. God knows the ugliest parts and still will save. But he knows things that we don't understand. He reveals deep and hidden things. I would say primarily for us, that's our need of a Savior. He reveals to us our need of him. Lost people, they don't know how bad they need Jesus until God flips on that light bulb and they say, wow, I, I need to get right with God. You don't know that unless God gives it to you. As we go on, we're moving quickly, my friends. Verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to, to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show him, or I will show the king the interpretation. Daniel saying today for everybody, right? Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said this to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. Now you can almost hear Nebuchadnezzar saying, all right, bring him in. They already told me they couldn't do it. My guy said it couldn't be done. My enchanters and my magicians, you know, my magic men said, you know, they, they couldn't do it. But let's go ahead and see what this slave has to say. Let's see what this prisoner of war has to say. Yeah, I know he put him through our schools, but the expectation is still not that high. He's not one of us. Well, it doesn't matter if he's one of us, he's one of God's, amen? Amen. It doesn't matter if he's part of the majority, he's one of God's people. And this is what happens in verse number 26. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And I love Daniel's response here. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven. There's a part of me that reads that, and this is what I do. Mm. I read that, I'm like, come on. <laughs> I see that, I'm like, oh man, Daniel's preaching right here. Daniel's getting ready to go. Uh, he's standing before the king to try and interpret a dream, and he's going to preach for a minute first. He says, listen, let me tell you something. Your wise men can't do it. Your enchanters can't do it. Your magicians can't do it. Your astrologers cannot do it. Nobody on earth can do it. But let me tell you, there's a God in heaven who can do something. Well, let's just flip that around today. We're looking for answers in everything. We're looking for a wisdom in everything. I want to figure out my purpose in life. I want to figure out what I'm supposed to do. I want to figure out who I'm supposed to marry. I want to figure out how much to save, what to invest in, where to retire, when to retire, how to retire. What should I do about this? Should I believe in God? Should I trust the Bible? Should I get saved? Should I live in rebellion? Whatever it may be. Let me tell you, quit looking around the earth, the world, mankind's always going to have more options, but they are not the God in heaven. There's a lot of options on earth, but there's only one God in heaven. That's the contrast. That's the breaking point. There's all of this, but there is a God in heaven. They don't know what's going on. They don't know the answer. They don't have the solution, but there's a God in heaven. 
They can't figure it out. They can't offer life and forgiveness or being put back together for the brokenness of sin. But let me tell you, there's a God in heaven who can do these things. That right there, I could preach a whole sermon on, but there is a God in heaven. Now, how might you do that? No, we're not going to do that. There is a God in heaven. You just put anything you want to there. None of this other stuff, but there's a God in heaven. Daniel goes on to say, who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king of Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. What's the point here? That our God is wiser than all. You're not going to find the meaning to your life in science. You're not going to find the meaning to your life in success. You will not find the meaning and the purpose and the answer to your questions from other people. It will not come through money or success or education or even love, but it will come from God. The wisdom that we desperately need comes from God. You may have all of this, but there's a God in heaven. You may think you haven't figured it out. You don't. There's a God in heaven. The world tells you do anything you want, live how you want, be your own boss, define what is right and wrong in your own eyes. By the way, the Bible says in the book of Judges, people did what was right in their own eyes, and God had to punish them for that. Don't do what's right in your own eyes. Do what's right for God in heaven. Don't find your own truth. Your own truth is worthless. Find the truth of the God in heaven. We all have our own truths. Your truth's as good as my truth. We don't need that kind of truth. We need God's truth. The truth that's truly true and stands forever. This is the dream. Verse 29. We're going to read what his dream was. And then we're going to talk about more about his dream in tonight's Bible study. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. Verse 30. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Daniel says, listen, it's not about me, it's all about God. This is the dream, verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you. And its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and, middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hands, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff on the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now this is some kind of crazy dream. A statue, and you got a head of one kind of metal, a chest of a different kind of metal, a stomach, a middle part of different kinds of metal, thighs, feet, all different kinds of materials, and then a big stone comes and crushes it all. I think you know what we're getting at, don't you? Well, we'll keep reading. Verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell you king, the king its interpretation. So you might be wondering, what does this mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. God's word tells us. Verse 37. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom... The God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. And into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Verse 39. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. Verse 41. And as you saw the feet 
and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. Some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. Wow. This statue is speaking of different kingdoms, different nations, different authorities, but they're all going to be crushed. Look what it says in verse 44. And this is our uh, fourth point this morning. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. Let me tell you, who is this king of glory? He is the king of an everlasting kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was going to come and go. The different empires that followed him would come and go. The kingdom represented by bronze and silver and clay and iron and all that, they would come and go. And they'd blow away like chaff on the threshing floor. But do you remember what it said in verse 34? As you looked, a stone was cut by no human hand. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Do you see there in the last part of verse 35, it says, But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You know what this stone is? This is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You might have the Roman Empire. You might have the Medo-Persian Empire. You might have Babylon. You might have... The European Union and China and India and the United States of America. Let me just tell it to you plainly. Ain't none of them as good as God's kingdom. Ain't none of them going to last forever compared to God's kingdom. God's kingdom will crush all of the kingdoms. And this mountain, this stone will turn into a mountain that fills the whole earth. What is this talking about? You're sitting in it today. It's called the church. This kingdom right here. What did Jesus say? He says, go into all the earth and preach the gospel. The kingdom of God is an everlasting kingdom. That's what it says in Psalm 145, 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. God's kingdom is not made by human hands. It's made by the nail-scarred hands. Uh, it's different in every way in human kingdoms. We don't have presidents or prime ministers or kings. We have the king of kings and the lord of lords. It's not based on the economy or uh, the army or, or maybe just the, you know, the constitution or whatever it is. It's based on God. And there is no end to his kingdom. His kingdom is his people. His kingdom is the church. It will never fail. As we close this morning. We're going to start landing this plane. After all of this, uh, I'll tell you what, end of verse 45, it says, A great God has made known, made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his faith and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. Verse 47, the king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Last two verses in this chapter. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of of the province of Babylon, Daniel remained at the king's court. Wow, what a great turnabout there. All because of God. What is we, the last thing we see here is that our God is the best. He's not just the best, he's the only. 
verse 4, he says, As your God is the God of gods and Lord of kings. We need to understand today that our God is greater than all. Our God is more powerful than all. Our God is wiser than all. He is the king of an everlasting kingdom. And he is the best, and not only the best, he is the only God. This morning, God has reminded us of how great and powerful he is. And I have to ask you, doesn't that comfort you? To know that God's in control, doesn't it make you glad to see how God is victorious? You and I are able to live with confidence and peace knowing that God's kingdom will never be overthrown. His throne is never empty. We must surrender to him. He must be our God. Would you bow this morning as we begin to close in prayer? Before we pray, I just want to encourage you to ask yourself, is he your God? Is he your king? If he's not, he can be. Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive you of your sins, to make you his people. You say, how do I become part of this kingdom? Oh, friend, it's not hard. You turn from your sins. You turn from yourself. You turn from your works and your religious stuff even, and you just give it all to God. You turn to him. Turn from your sin and trust what Christ Jesus has done to save you. We call that repentance. Repent. And believe the gospel. This morning, if you're a saved person, if you're a Christian, let this encourage you. Don't worry about things. Don't stress. Our God is in control. Let us pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this great reminder from your word that you are God Almighty. You are better than all. You are in control. Lord, let that give us confidence and peace in these troublesome days. Lord, there's any here today who have not surrendered to you. That they are not able to say that you are their king. Lord, let today be the day they bow the knee before King Jesus. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.